today, um, according to the um, schedule of this class, um, I've prepared things on uh, discrete continuous choice models, so the integration of both discrete choices uh, and continuous choices, which are, um, which this is a subject that is uh, new um, in uh, discrete choice modeling. Uh, it's new in transportation. Um, there are a number of um, recent research paper appearing in the best journal, Transportation Research Part B, for example. Um, and um, I will present some of the results that are in the literature and also some of our recent results, um, the, the method that um, we apply and that it's uh, uh, different from what uh, other people are doing. Um, in particular, um, um, you will see many applications on household vehicle ownership uh, because this is the topic that I'm um, now currently um, on, work, on which I'm working. Uh, and you know why? Because in the US, 95% um, of the trips are made by cars. There is a huge um, debate about what will be the future of that country uh, with car, without cars, which type of cars. There is a room for new type of car. So that's why uh, we have a kind of national model now um, uh, my student is just uh, finishing her PhD dis um, dissertation. She's from China, and uh, she has a lot of results about this. At the end, she will have um, a national model for car ownership uh, with very with um, a lot of details, um, and this it's ready to be applied in order to calculate greenhouse gas emission. And we are very concerned about greenhouse gas emission also here. Um, also, we are very concerned. That in the US, but for example, is a, a concern also for Ch from China. And in fact, my students, uh, she has, um, in March, she was in uh, Tianjin, which is uh, her um, home city. And she said, you know, I haven't seen the color of the sky for three weeks because uh, it, the pollution was so bad. Uh, and she said, you know, I feel that what I've done here might be useful for my country um, when um, and if she goes back. When we started this research, we felt that there are two um, papers in the literature that, are, uh, that were similar to what we intended to do. Uh, so the, there were a couple of papers from Professor Chandra Bhatt, Texas Austin, that proposed discrete continuous extreme value uh, models. And also there was a another interesting paper from um, a PhD student from Irvine. This is um, Audrey Feng. Um, and um, she was a PhD student from David Brownstone uh, at Irvine, and she proposed a very comprehensive model based on ordered probit and tobit, and she makes a very interesting estimation of this with Bayesian. Uh, so these people, they are more from economics. They do application in, transport in transportation, but you see that the difference between what we do. So she estimates that model with Bayesian. Uh, so we thought that these two uh, approaches were um, kind of good inspiration for us. So you see that everything is quite new, um, and there are not many other research groups who are working on this. So these were our main source of inspiration. So I'm going to describe these two um, approaches, because that's uh, where we learned this uh, stuff from. Um, OK, um, this is where. Uh, uh, I will explain a theory and application at the same time today. So this is more a research presentation than a lecture. Um, OK, so the, uh, the problem that both Chandra Bhatt and Audrey Fang uh, were facing is they wanted to um, describe the discrete choice of vehicle type categories. So in particular, they wanted to see how people choose between a small car, large car, or between cars and trucks. Um, so it's a vehicle type choice. It's not really car ownership in which you decide um, how many cars, but it's which type of cars you, want to, uh, you are going to have in your household. Uh, and then the other problem was the continuous choice. So the continuous choice is how many miles I travel on this type of car. So the idea is that they wanted to know how many miles you put on your car, and in particular, what happens if the external condition changes? So is the behavior going to change? For example, if fuel price, which is now very cheap in the US, 
is going to increase, what I'm going to do? Am I going, for example, to use a small car, an electric car, a more efficient car? And what about if density, uh, in particular, other things, she's interested in density? You know that in the US, we have the problem of urban sprawling. Uh, we have uh, this uh, development outside of the city center, and so people travel very long distance in order to get to their um, uh, job place. They, they don't care about where they live because they have a car, fuel is inexpensive, so they take their car and uh, they travel even one hour every morning to, uh, to reach their uh, um, destination. So they were interested in this kind of policy. And so uh, this were, was the problem that they were facing. So you see that this is quite different from the problem that we have seen so far, in which just discrete choices were available to the decision maker. So here you want joint decision, which, are, which have two components. One thing is, is discrete, and the other one is continuous. Um, and also the other problem here is that uh, these two choices are correlated, in the sense that um, um, if I have a small car, uh, perhaps I will travel more with that car. So I cannot analyze this jointly, these two choices, because in the past, people have done already this. For example, can train PhD dissertation in 78 was about this, but it was just analyzing this jointly, these choices. So there was not a unified framework able to do this. So they wanted to have in one modeling framework both decisions. OK, so let's see a bit of math um, about, um, so this is what Chandrabhat does, right? So what you have here, you, ha you have k different vehicle types that a household can potentially own. So as I was saying, k is vehicle type. So is, uh, for example, um, car, small car, a large car, is a truck, is an SUV, uh, and so on. So it's a type car. And also you have the continuous variables, which is MJ, and this is the, the annual mileage uh, of use for vehicle type J. So in the utility becomes this, right? So you have both the discrete component and the continuous component. So the discrete component is kind of this C, C of XJ, and this is the continuous component. Um, so E calls this C of, how do you call this? C, anyway, it will be C for us. Uh, it's, it's kind of the baseline utility for vehicle type J. It's, uh, it's similar to what we always uh, do when we specify utility for a vehicle type. Like it's the utility that you derive from the fact that you have a certain car. Uh, and as, um, as usual, is a function of observed characteristic X of um, the vehicle type J. Um, and um, you have additional parameters to be estimated, um, these two, um, that um, you will see will uh, get a particular interpretation here. So again, um, you define an utility, which is a function of a discrete utility of um, owning a car, uh, of the continuous variables of um, uh, traveling some miles with this car. So what happens? Um, so the interpretation of this. So what I'm describing here is um, a little bit the interpretation of this, of this different way to specify the utility. So what's happening here? Um, for example, if you have a high value of CXJ, so you have a high value, so you value very highly your car. It's, it means that uh, you, you get a lot of utility from owning this kind of car. For example, you have a, a brand new car, you really like that car, so the baseline utility for that car is very high. Um, and if you have a value of alpha j very close to 1, um, which is called, uh, Chandra Bhatt called this satiation effect, is um, are you are satisfied with the, your utility? So it means that, um, it means that if your xi and your alpha so if your C is very high and your alpha is very close to 1, so alpha is between 0 and 1 for some mathematical reason, uh, what happens is that you are very happy with your car and there is nothing in the world that you can exchange with your car, especially not another car. It means that you like your car, it's your own car, and you will use that car, doesn't matter what happens outside. 
all right? So this represents a situation where the household primarily uses only one vehicle type for all its travel needs. So it's kind of a household that likes one type of car. For example, in my household, we like all the small cars. And uh, there is nothing that will uh, make us change, I, ex except if something exceptional on the market become available. But this is, um, this is kind of a homogeneous household. If uh, on, the, on the opposite side, if you have a C that has a small value and alpha that uh, varies across the, va the different vehicle, then um, you have a household that um, uses multiple vehicle types. So you have a household in which, for example, and this is typical for the American situation, uh, the situation is that households have different cars, um, perhaps three or four cars, and they have all variety of cars. So they have a small car, a very large car, a sporty car, a sport car, uh, and um, a truck. So they uh, seek variety because they will use a different car depending on uh, the, the, the kind of trip that you need to do, right? So this is, so you see that this, um, uh, in this uh, specification is very appealing because you can characterize uh, this kind of behavior. So this is the interpretation. Uh, in particular now, uh, um, so um, this is the general formulation. This is quite general. Now, um, Chandrabhat um, wants to, uh, he, he makes some manipulation because his objective is to solve this in closed form. He, um, so if we have seen a lot of simulation, a lot of trouble in simulating in the past two days. So his objective was to have a closed mathematical form for this. He didn't want to deal with simulation. Uh, so it's, uh, if you see his presentation now, when you can avoid simulation, please do um, avoid simulation. Well, you can agree or not with that, but uh, that's what he's proposing now. Although he's now back to simulation. If you see the paper from last year B, he has a lot of simulation. Okay, so uh, now, given that he wanted to, cl to solve this in closed form, um, he has an exponential formula for this C. So you see that it's very similar to the utility of logic, except that um, he has an exponential form because he needed to have this always positive for his calculation. You see, um, he wants um, an exponential form for, uh, to guarantee that um, um, the baseline utility is always positive. So it's kind of mathematical formulation. So you see that then the utility is going to be this. So this is the baseline utility, this is the mileage, and these are parameters to be calibrated. And yes, the x because um, of this positivity of the utility that he needed to ensure for this formulation. Uh, also alpha j, this satiation effect, uh, as I say, this constraint between 0 and 1. And um, I gave the interpretation. So if you have a alpha j very close to 1, it means that uh, your utility doesn't change uh, with uh, the type of car, but it's kind of you are satisfied with what you have and you don't have much flexibility in using different type of car. Uh, and so this is also parameterized to be between um, 0 and 1. Uh, and also um, this um, delta J um, is, can be function of uh, household characteristics. So you can have a different satiation effect based on different household characteristics. So like income, uh, number of people in the household, number of kids. So you kind of have a satiation depending on uh, the household characteristics. Um, all right, so um, everything very good so far. Um, I will. Uh, the problem is that in this um, specification, um, this is the main assumption that we didn't like. So when we analyzed this model, we said, well, this is perfect. The problem is that you work under um, a fixed uh, mileage budget. It means that um, the total sum of mileage, that, of miles that you cover with your, the, your car in the household is uh, uh, is equal to the total uh, number of miles that your household is doing uh, per day or per, per year. So it's kind of fixed budget. So at the end, 
the total mileage is not a policy variable. It's something that it's there. You are just allocating mileage to the different car. So uh, any idea why we didn't like this? So this was not what we wanted. So we were kind of stuck there. We said, well, this framework is very nice, but it's not what we wanted. So any idea why this is kind of, well, it is, was good enough for what he was doing, but for us was kind of a limitation. Why this? Well, it's real because this is the number of miles that uh, have been uh, uh, revealed by the, um, uh, by the household. Actually, all these models are calibrated on uh, the National Household Travel Survey, so NHTS. And uh, many of these models are calibrated from the old one, the 2001 uh, National Household Travel Survey. That, um, so we will see some of this um, on, mon on Monday. OK, so um, any other ideas? The students out there. And the problem here is, as I said, is that then mileage is not a policy variable in the sense that um, if you change the external condition, this uh, the total number of mileage will never change. Uh, it means that uh, if you um, change the density, if you change fuel price, um, all, all will change is the allocation of this number of miles to the vehicle type. So if, for example, if um, fuel cost increases, uh, this model will tell you that you will use your small car that is in your household. You won't use your truck because it's becoming expensive. If you change density, this will tell you that, again, you use, uh, for example, uh, an electric car because you cover um, smaller, uh, shorter distances. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the total um, number of miles won't change in your household, which is, which can be acceptable, uh, for example, in the US case where you see that demand is very unelastic with respect to fuel price. But we have seen in Europe, for example, and especially in my country, uh, in the last two years, the fuel price has increased 20, 30 percent, and we have seen a decrease in the number of uh, miles traveled of about 10, 15 percent. In certain cities, you have 20 percent less miles traveled. So this model will be not sensible to this kind of, uh, um, of um, policy or fuel price increase. Okay, so this is um, uh, this is a little bit of math. Uh, honestly, um, every time I see that, I um, anyway, um, Chandra does this, um, he calculates the probability. But you see also the other assumption is that epsilon j are i, i, d uh, gamble, and um, so um, still is under a logit um, assumption. So this is a continuous logit. So there is no correlation across uh, the epsilon, although he says that um, c this can be extended. But I think uh, they wanted to generalize this. But at the end of the day, they discovered that it was not that easy to generalize this. Um, so this is uh, the calculation of the probability. He has a closed mathematical form. Um, and this is what you get for, uh, from, yeah, you need to do some math in order to derive this. But it's, um, it's closed mathematical form. OK, so um, then I asked my students to say um, what, what is good and what is bad about this. So what is good is that this was one, uh, one of the first attempts in transportation to have a joint framework for discrete and continuous decision. So the decision are vehicle types and mileage for each vehicle type. Uh, you are under a random utility maximization um, framework subjected to total mileage budget. You have a single error term. Also, this is um, also this is a, a little bit restrictive. You have a single error term in the discrete part, but you can uh, estimate this with maximum likelihood inference approach. I don't know why she's saying quasi Monte Carlo because this is um, this, there is no simulation. Um, it's closed form. Uh, it co ah, um, it collapses to M and L uh, for uh, one car. So um, if you have just one car in the household. This is just uh, MNL. Does not estimate the total number of vehicles in the household. So now let's see what uh, Audrey Fang does. So she has a similar problem. The discrete choice is uh, now 
uh, number of cars and uh, number of trucks. So she just says two type of vehicle, cars against trucks. And uh, she also wants to estimate um, uh, mileage on each car and mileage on each truck. Now, instead of having um, a, um, a multinomial logic, she has an ordered logic. Um, and so, um, the, um, so what she's modeling here is you have car and truck, and she's modeling how many cars and how many trucks you have in your, in your <coughs> household and how many miles you do with each of these um, car or trucks. So instead of having, um, so you have a latent continuous variables. This is typical of ordered logic. And, uh, and this represents the preference level, right? This is a latent variable. So you just represent the preference level for ordering cars and trucks. And um, so these are um, the ordered logic um, independent, uh, dependent variable, no, latent class variable, latent continuous variable. And this is the continuous part. So y1 and y2 is kind of the discrete part, and y3 and y4 are the continuous part. And these are uncensored uh, average annual miles driven by cars and truck. So you have a system of equation. You have uh, one part of the system of this equation that is the discrete part, and the other part is the continuous part. Now, uh, when I was looking at this yesterday, it's a bit confusing because everything seems the same. But it's because uh, she used the s exactly the same specification for the discrete part and the continuous part, because I think this makes everything easier in her specification. But this is kind of, there is a separation line here. So this is the discrete part, which is ordered logic uh, or ordered probit. And this is uh, the continuous part that is, in particular, uh, a tobit. Um, you see that here, uh, she has different error component, right? So this makes the model more general, because uh, sh um, she can specify different error for each of these equations. And uh, she, has, um, uh, she has kind of household characteristics, this w. And in particular, this study was about density. So she has the log of the density in the specification. So she wanted to see how the use of car and trucks and the mileage on car and trucks changes with density. So if we make city in the United States more dense, uh, what's going to happen? Just the way um, you specify uh, an order of the logic, an order or, or probit, um, and um, um, so, um, and, and, and you see this, uh, that this is conditional in the sense that uh, you don't make any miles if you don't have any car, right? So this is conditional on, um, on, the, um, on, the, on the ownership of car. Then she makes a number of assumptions on the way uh, she um, estimates uh, this probit model because uh, she wants to make everything easier for the estimation of this because this is a joint model. It's a ordered probit plus uh, a tobit. So she has a number of issues in estimation. So um, uh, she fixed this um, um, lowest and highest kite point in the ordered probit. So he, she makes some assumptions that, uh, that she took from the econometrics literature. Um, and so she makes that because then the variance of the ordered equation are no longer restricted to one. Because um, um, when, you, when you have these discrete and continuous models, you have um, a covariance matrix, and uh, you need to impose some restriction. So she found in the literature that if you fix the cut points of the ordered point, you don't need to make any assumption on the variance of the ordered equation. So this is just a technical manipulation, but doesn't change uh, what she is doing. But what is important is that the error structure now, remember that now you have errors in the discrete part and errors in the continuous part. And now this error structure is a multivariate normal. That's also why she's using ordered probit. Uh, because then you can have a multivariate probit, uh, a multivariate normal uh, with zero mean and unrestricted. That's what we wanted. At the end of the day, we want to calculate the correlation between the error of the discrete part and the continuous part. That's what makes this framework um, 
um, joint joint right that's what it makes the correlation between the discrete part and the continuous part and so that's what she's doing at the end so this is the log likelihood uh, very nice um, so what she's she's doing here she's working again with discrete and continuous she has uh, alternatives are just two types of alternatives number of cars and number of trucks uh, she has mileage, um, she wants to predict the, the number of miles on the cars and the number of miles on the track. Uh, she uses ordered probit. This is very important. This is the main difference with the, what we have seen before in which we had just logit. Uh, and she used tobit for uh, the continuous part. And also here, she doesn't have the assumption that the total um, budget is fixed. So the, she, um, pa, um, the total mileage traveled by the household is um, a policy variable. So can change in response to changes in policy variable. Um, the error term is very flexible. You have seen that she has different error terms across all uh, the discrete and the continuous part. And uh, she uh, uses uh, the Bayesian approach, and in particular, the Gibbs sampler. I haven't seen much about uh, Bayesian estimation, but here, everything is normal. So you can use the Gibbs sampler. And uh, this, is, um, this is quite nice. When you are able to use the Gibbs sampler, it's quite nice. So what we like about this is uh, this is quite easy to implement. You will see that the fact that she uses ordered probit uh, makes everything a little bit uh, easier. Um, she can handle a large uh, total number of vehicles, although um, once you start to have many of these classes, the model becomes very complicated. Um, there, is a very well there is a very good structure that captures the independence between the number of vehicles in specific categories and the mileage travel. This is the covariance uh, matrix that allows to do this. It's flexible in the specification of the error terms between the discrete and the continuous submodel. And this is also more flexible with respect to what Chandra was doing, who has a, a common error term between the discrete and the continuous part. It becomes computationally intensive when you increase the vehicles because you, have a, you can have many of these categories. You, when you, uh, you will see that in our framework, we have many of these vehicle types. So um, this is kind of um, becomes very difficult. The other problem, the main problem we found here, remember that this was our literature review. It's what I asked my student to do when we decided what we are going to do. Uh, there are many papers in transportation that says that uh, the ordered mechanism is not good. Uh, for car ownership. There are a number of uh, very famous papers that say that uh, for vehicle ownership, we use logit, not ordered logit. It will be quite um, natural. Where are the new ones? It, um, you know, when, we, when, I, when I say modeling uh, vehicle ownership, it's kind of you want to model uh, if a household, this is a household decision. If a household has zero car, uh, one car, two car, three cars, uh, four cars. In real, this is what we have um, in the US. So this is um, utility one, zero, utility of one, utility of two, utility of three, utility of four plus. So we have, um, so many uh, researchers in transportation um, thought that um, the right way to model this is with ordered logic, right? There is a natural order in the number of vehicles that a household holds. Uh, so um, they said ordered logic or ordered probit. And there are a number of papers that compare this with logit, in which instead of um, modeling the order of this, you just model the utility of zero car, the utility. So it's just multinomial logit. And they say that logit is always superior to order the logic. So the right mechanism is um, logic. So that's why maybe this has limitation. Uh, we have also, uh, you will see some of our results. Uh, so this might, might have limitation. And, um, and also, the other thing is, although I'm not sure if this can be done, but she has the same variable both in the uh, discrete part and the continuous part. So um, this was kind of troublesome. Um, anyway, 
So, but anyway, this is a very good study published on um, Transportation Research Part B. Many of the things that you have seen are published on Transportation Research Part B. It means that are still kind of theoretical development and um, not many people are applying this. All right. Um, now, um, the equation because uh, uh, all the positive yes all the positive. Be, yeah because uh, it's a sensor that's zero uh, so this is in uh, what they are doing I, I really like this this is what my students made so in synthesis that's what they do right Chandra Bath yes uh, first of all the decision maker is the household then yes different types of variable of, um, of cars and uh, you have yes or no. So for example, you have car, yes or no. You have a truck, yes or no. You have an SUV, yes or no. You have an electric car, yes or no. And then um, you predict for each of these type uh, the number of miles that you allocate to this type of car subjected to um, kind of constraint, which is the total mileage driven uh, by the household in a year. While Frank, she's doing, um, she has just two types. She has cars against trucks, against trucks. And uh, you predict how many with an ordered probic mechanism. So I have zero, one, two, three, four of this type of car. And how many miles I have for each of this type of car. Let's see a little bit of um, the results that they, got, they get. But this is a little bit about data. Let's see what uh, they do with that. So this is the type of car that Chandra Bhatta has in his paper. And this is in particular for one vehicle household. So you have cars, sports cars, pickup truck, minivan, and van. And um, so many of these people with just one car, uh, with just one vehicle, they have a car. So there are not many trucks or SUV. And uh, they travel about 10,000 miles. So that's the average in the United States. I think this is California. But if you see the pictures in Maryland, they won't be much different from this. Maybe they have a little bit less cars, but it's not much different from this. This is two vehicles household. Uh, you start to see that, um, so this is a combination, right? Because you need to consider all the combinations. So if your first car is a passenger car, uh, what about um, the second car? Uh, and you start to see that uh, people having a passenger car, there are more that also have a pickup truck, an SUV, and minivan. And I think that exactly what happens in the United States. You have a variety of cars. You, you tend to have all kinds of cars in, in your household. Uh, if you have two cars, um, you kind of do, um, yeah, this is, 20,000, this is 40,000, and so this is the, um, the number of miles that you do. So this is the model estimated, um, well, you have all kinds of household de social demographic variables. It's similar to, to logit, right? Uh, it's similar to what you get with the logit model, except that you estimate in addition these satiation parameters, uh, which was our um, alpha in the specification, and also, uh, the other problem is that, again, when he applies the model, so when he estimates the model, um, it's closed mathematical form. When he applies the model, he needs to solve this. And this is a um, constrained optimization problem that I think, um, well, he needed to solve using simulation. So uh, it means that he can estimate the model without simulation, but then when he applies the model, he has a constrained optimization problem that he needs to solve with the simulation. So he's still, he, he needs um, um, simulation when he solves that problem. So, um, and this was the problem when he tried to generalize this model. So the generalization to nested logic or to other forms of uh, uh, discrete choice model was difficult because of this. So I remember him describing this as a quite difficult. Yeah. Yes. The, the, the reason they use simulation is because it's more handy or? Uh, no, because he has to do it. He, and there is no other way. Or because you, he has all these integrals. So there are no integrals in the estimation 
But then, yes, uh, I don't know where all these integrals come from, uh, uh, honestly. But you see that when he, um, when he um, applies this, he has this kind of integral, because I think they come from this constrained optimization problem. Remember that, yes, the constraint of fixed um, mileage? That's why at one point, um, I don't know why, I've never applied this. I found it difficult to apply what, uh, um, even if Chandra is software in his website, when we try to replicate it, it's always a nightmare. So we, we started from scratch our own stuff instead of applying this. I'm sure he will, now that the paper is under review, he will say, compare with my model. And it will be not easy. But Sorry, what is more uh, In Chandra's data set, there's only 14 meds. 14 meds. 14? The vehicle types. How many? 14. 14? Yeah, compared to passenger cars, you have 1,300. So uh, this, like, the, the previous one, yeah, this one, the distribution uh -huh. of the vehicle types. So the, the small number of, like, mini van or van will cause any computation problem? Well, he estimated the problem. So maybe yes, but maybe not. Uh, at the end of the day, this is a logic. Uh, so if you have this, maybe it will be difficult to replicate the probability of the van, but I think it's feasible. And if you see, he has everything, you see? Uh, yeah. But he has a very high um, alternative specific constant uh, for, no, but here, you see that everything is significant. And this is just uh, very negative. But I think it's feasible. I don't see any problem in calibrating this. Uh, the application, uh, again, he, he needs simulation at this point. OK, um, a little bit about the results. So uh, how, what you can do with this kind of model. So you see that he's studying the impact of um, uh, increase in operating fuel costs from 1.4 per gallon to uh, $2 per gallon. So remember that this is 2001. Uh, so in 2001, um, the fuel price was 1.4. So he's saying, let's see what happens if the, fuel, the, the cost is uh, increasing to two. Uh, you see that in vehicle holdings, um, what people are doing is um, um, they have um, less sports car. Uh, they have um, less pickup truck, less minivan, and less Van. However, where are these cars going? Right? Ish. Uh, this is percent and changes in vehicle holding of vehicle type. You should have a positive sign somewhere. I'm not sure, actually. Well, this makes sense because this is the use, right? So you are using more your passenger car. And given that there are many of these, uh, you use less um, the other type of car, right? So this makes perfect sense. But what about this? Yeah, but it, it should increase a little bit, no? There is no uh, getting rid of my car. Uh, I don't know. This is the first time I. The model didn't constrain the vehicle type, only constrain on the number of mileage. Yeah, it only constrains the number of mileage. But the, mile, the number of mileage makes sense to me. Yeah, because? Yeah, because this, there are many, so you use more the passenger car, and you use less the other type of car. But this is a little bit strange. I needed to ask my students. She will know. <laughs> or Chandra. Um, OK, but you see that here. You cannot um, test, for example, if um, people are driving less in total. You just are predicting how you um, uh, allocate your mileage from a car to another. You cannot say, I'm traveling 10% less, or I'm traveling 5% less. So that's the main limitation of this. Fang, this is uh, her model. You see that she's very much interested in uh, residential density. So these are the descriptive statistics. Again, this is the same data set. This is 2001 uh, 
San Francisco Bay Area. Are the variables that she's using. Uh, so you see that she has exactly the same variable both in the discrete part. These are the variable of the discrete part and these are the variable in the continuous part. So she has the same variable in discrete and continuous part. Uh, and uh, she's very much interested in the density. So all this is uh, about density. She has a number of uh, um, social demographic variables, income, uh, if it is urban or not, number of adults, household size, number of bytes, education, and some specific about um, the city in California. You, will see, you see that here she doesn't have any um, cost. So she doesn't have any fuel costs. She just has density. Uh, so now what is she's doing is she's changing uh, the density. So she's, for example, increasing density by 10%, 25%, and 50%. And she's um, uh, calculating the percentage change for track choices. And um, so you see that. The results of this is that nothing changes in the sense that if you increase density even by 50 percent, um, um, nothing changes. These are very small numbers. So these are uh, car and truck ownership. So it means that even if density increases a lot, um, there is no changes in um, vehicle ownership. Right, so that, that's what uh, this is telling us. So this is changes in uh, miles driven. So the, the first part was about the discrete part, right? So this is the application to the discrete part, the vehicle uh, ownership, and this is about the miles that you travel. So here, again, the numbers are very small. You see that 1%, uh, less than 1%, and this is in car. Something happens in trucks. So right, you travel, for example, if, if um, density increases by 50%, which is a lot, uh, you um, the miles with your truck will decrease by 8%, but uh, just by 1% with your car, right? So, um, so the, out of this, she was able to say, uh, you know that in the United States, uh, for, for the last 10 uh, years, uh, we have been working on um, smart growth. Smart growth means increase the density because then uh, people will travel less, will own less car, they will work and shop and have leisure in the same place. This is saying that uh, maybe not. Um, and th there is an explanation also um, with respect to this. The problem is that there is no alternative to car in the United States. So they will use their car anyway because there is no public transportation alternatives. I think that's what this kind of study are saying to the decision maker. This is my idea, but I'm open to other interpretation about this. Uh, this is quite scary. When you look at this, this is quite scary. But anyway, I found this a very good study. I think this is very good uh, both from the econometric perspective and from the application. So that's the idea of this study. You see uh, the idea behind this. All right. This is also, um, um, uh, this is the correlation matrix. So remember that. Uh, so you have uh, um, the error structures is a multivariate normal with zero mean and unrestricted covariance matrix, right? So uh, at the end, what I've shown you are the betas. But on the top of the betas, she also estimated the sigma, which is the correlation matrix, and which, which gives you the correlation between the discrete part and the continuous part, right? That's what makes this a discrete continuous choice model. So she has correlation between the error in the um, uh, the error in the so she has uh, the correlation between the average car miles and the number of cars, and the correlation between the average car miles and the number of trucks, uh, and the same correlation between average truck miles and um, number of trucks and average car miles. Remember that here you have just one error component in the ordered structure, right? So there is one, if you use an ordered probit, 
If you use an ordered probit, there is an error for the car um, and an epsilon for uh, the um, track. And this is correlated with, um, so this is kind of discrete, discrete, and then this is correlated with epsilon car uh, continuous, epsilon track continuous, right? This is different uh, when you are, and you will see that in our application when you work with logit, because logit will have a different epsilon in um, each of these alternatives, right? Here you have a, just one latent variable with one error term, and here you will have different ones. So that's why um, in that case, this matrix is quite easy to estimate, right? This is what she has. Um, so you see that, for example, this is negative because the more cars you have, the less you travel with your truck, right? This is natural. It's, it makes sense. Uh, the more trucks you have, the more miles you travel with your truck, right? So you see that this decision are joined, and that's what this correlation matrix, this covariance matrix is capturing is the correlation between the discrete and the continuous part. So the more um, you travel with your truck, uh, the less uh, you travel with your car. This is a correlation matrix. Uh, average uh, Han miles or average Chang miles uh, is the sum of the number of the cars, not Yes, yeah. Yeah, but remember that here you have uh, the, um, you have, uh, the ordered uh, probit. So you, you can have zero cars, one car, two cars, three cars, four yeah. cars. So it's, uh, it's, everything is accounted, yes. So you know how many of these you have in your whole household. Oh, now she has a um, car divided in small car and large car, and small, ca uh, uh, small truck and large truck. And so she has different effect. And uh, um, you see that now this is increasing because uh, if you just divide the car in small and large, see uh, how, more, how much more complicated this stuff becomes, right? So she estimated the model again by increasing the number of type that she is including. So can you see the difference between what we have seen uh, in the last four days and two days? So this is, uh, this is really what people are doing now, uh, which is the extension of discrete choice models to uh, this um, uh, joint framework in which also continuous decisions are taken into account. All right, now um, that's what other people have been done, uh, have done. Uh, so now that's, that's what we do. Um, so the motivation behind that, um, I would say there are two main mo uh, motivations or three. So we wanted to overcome a number of <coughs> limitations of the previous studies, and in particular, we were, we were interested uh, in having the total miles driven as a decision variable. We wanted to be able to predict changes in total miles uh, driven in the United States due to changes in policy variable, in particular fuel price uh, and uh, density. Uh, the other thing is uh, that we didn't want to use the ordered probit mechanism. We wanted to have an unordered mechanism because uh, by reading the papers, you will see that the ordered uh, mechanism is not the one that is the most appropriate for uh, car ownership. And the other thing is that instead, we were not interested just in type because you see that these models um, are mainly analyzed type, are restricted to type of vehicles and miles driven. We wanted a complete framework, a comprehensive framework, and in particular we wanted to solve jointly the framework that was um, given by McFadden and Train in the late 70s. So if you see the, the um, um, Ken Train has a book. He's, he wrote the book after his PhD dissertation, quite impressive. So after uh, he, he, he published this book, the book is still excellent. So um, in his book, he describes uh, the framework that they um, propose for vehicle ownership that I think is very comprehensive. And this framework says that, first of all, you need to predict the number of cars. 
So the number of cars means you need to predict if a household owns zero car, one car, two cars, three cars, or four plus cars. So this is what's modeled with uh, logic. And that's why um, many papers say that order at logic or order at probit are not good enough for this kind of decision. Then uh, the second decision, so there are three kinds of decision here. <coughs> so the first one is car ownership, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 plus vehicle. How many of these I have in my household? Maybe this is meaningless for you, because I think at most here they have one car. So for you will be uh, zero, one car. Do I have a car or not? But you know, it, this can be done also here. The second decision is type and vintage. It means which kind of car. And in particular, we have 12 categories for type and 10 vintages. So it means that we have 12 types and 10 vintages. So 12 types means small car, uh, large car, um, SUV, truck, domestic, or imported. So a combination of all this makes us having 12 types, which is based on small, large, I don't exactly remember, SUV, um, trucks, sports car, and uh, imported or domestic. This is important for the car industry in the US. They wanted to know if you are going to buy domestic car or imported car, although this was true 20 years ago. Now uh, it's just imported car <laughs> or domestic. And vintages is how old is this car? So vintages means that the car is, for example, one year old, two year old, and we go up to 10 years, 10 plus years. Um, so you see that here in our problem, which was the original uh, framework that we wanted to solve, we wanted a national household car ownership model. Uh, the combination of this gives 120 alternatives, which is not quite feasible with this, right? So it's not what we wanted. Um, and finally, we want to predict the total mileage driven. We didn't want the miles driven with, for, with each car. We wanted just the total mileage driven, because this is the important variable in, our, um, in a national uh, model for car ownership. So uh, well, we wanted to solve this. This was our um, objective. I want also to give you uh, some numbers for the United States that are kind of scary. Uh, but um, in the United States, 27% of the total greenhouse gas emission are um, due to transportation. Um, if you see the same, if you see uh, the same uh, data for uh, Europe, you will see that in Europe this is less than 20%. It's about 18 and 19%. So it means that in the United States we use too much the car, and the car are too inefficient. It means that with existing technology we can lower by 10% the greenhouse gas emission uh, by car. So this is, I think, very, very important. They needed to understand this. So this is something that they needed to adjust. 71% uh, of the total oil consumption comes from consumption from transportation. This is also scary, 70%. Um, and 40% uh, of this is for a uh, personal vehicle. So it's an unbelievable amount of oil consumed by personal vehicle. Uh, the total, uh, so the average vehicle ownership <coughs> per household is two cars. So uh, in general, they have two cars in the household. Um, and only 5% of the household, they don't have a car only 5%. So it means that in almost all the households, there is at least one car. So we are starting from uh, train 86. The, the fact that you can use for, um, um, you, you have seen that in both, uh, in uh, Fang, uh, she's using Tobit, which, um, which uh, it's a um, kind of truncated regression. Um, so the, the fact that you can use a linear regression comes from this Roy identity uh, property. So if you read the literature, uh, they explain why 
uh, for uh, the total mileage driven, this is about consumption, this is about uh, income and consumption, this is kind of economic theory, they will sh they'll show that you can use linear regression in order to um, um, estimate uh, the number of vehicle of, of mileage driven by the household. So that's what we want to do, right? We want to simultaneously estimate the discrete part so vehicle holding at types, so the decision one and two, and then the continuous decision, which will be three, which are the miles driven by the household. Uh, we want to take into account a large number of alternatives in both vehicle ownership and vehicle type. Uh, we, are, we don't want to have any budget constraints, and we want to uh, estimate the correlation between the unobserved factor of the discrete part and the continuous part. Similar to uh, what um, Fang has done, but have a flexible specification. So we want to be able to estimate different coefficient in, um, in the discrete part and the continuous part. Um, remember that I said that in Fang specification there was no cost. Right? Because in reality, and this is because cost affects just the use, not the ownership, right? So that's why we wanted to be able to have different variables in the discrete and the continuous part. Because then you are free and you can estimate all kinds of policy variables. So what we do here? So this is the equation that we use. So first of all, we start from this. So we start by estimating the uh, vehicle type and vintage. Uh, and in particular, this is this. This is estimated just uh, with a logit model, so just normal logit. Uh, the problem is that this model is not easy to estimate, first of all, because you need to know the characteristic of all the, these cars. So you need to construct the utility for each type and each vintage. And uh, just this took my students six months because you need uh, to record. This doesn't come from the National Household Travel Survey. We had to have additional data sets about cars and the characteristic of these cars. And uh, for example, the price of these cars. So we got this from the consumer report. So she opened that data set f and analyzed this data for 10 years. And she had to derive the characteristic of each type of car and each vintage for 120 alternatives. So, so huh? the blue book? The blue book? Uh, the consumer report? I don't know the color. I haven't seen it. I just know that she worked on this. And uh, this was the first thing that I gave her when she arrived. And she has done an excellent job. So the other thing is um, that uh, the problem here is that you work with 120 alternatives, which is um, a lot. But given that we are just using logic, you can uh, take advantage this time of the IA property. And instead of working with 120, what we do, I think she works with just 20 alternatives. So she picks the one that has been chosen, and she adds 20 random alternatives drawn from the 120. And uh, given that um, the, the, the IA uh, property, uh, coefficients are not biased. So she was able to do that, and so we calibrate this. Uh, once we calibrate this, uh, we calculate the log sum of that model. And this is the log sum. You see, we have seen that, right? The LN, the LN of the sum of the exp of the utility of the alternatives. And this, um, and, the, and um, so this is the model number two. This is the model number one. You see, we have um, kind of logit or probit, an ordered mechanism, right? We have an utility for zero, for one, for two, and for k cars. This is one. This is model number one. This is model number two. And um, uh, the way we connect model number one and number two is through the log sum. So once you calculate the log sum, this becomes a variable into the model of number of cars. And this gives you an idea of the utility of owing different types and um, vintage of cars. Right? So this is just, you see, this is J is just this J here. And this is similar, or it's, uh, it's exactly what um, uh, McFadden and Train suggest to do. So this is the way. Um, 
uh, they were doing it. Now that we have one and two together, let's join uh, three, right, the continuous part. So the first part is just the discrete part, and in particular, we use multinomial probit. Again, the choice of the probit was given by the fact that at the end, uh, we needed to connect these two, and uh, a multivariate uh, normal distribution was handy. Otherwise, you have a gamble in the discrete part and normal in the second part, and this is, this f this is difficult because you have two different families of uh, random variables. By having probit up and uh, regression with the normal down, we had just a multivariate normal distribution that was kind of not easy, but feasible. Uh, so that's what we have. We have a probit upstairs here, a multinomial probit, and then we have a regression down here. And um, uh, so these are the two separate models. And you see that we say that uh, we analyze the joint probability of, of owning a certain number, a certain number of cars, uh, given that we drive so many miles, right? So, um, in particular, we do the other way around. So we have the probability of having so many cars and of driving so many miles is uh, the, joint, the the product of the probability of driving so many miles multiplied by the probability of having so many cars given that we drive um, um, so many cars, right? Uh, you can also do the other way around. It's, it's just that the mathematical formulation was easier this way. You, need, you don't need to make any, as, any assumption, and they are just equivalent, right? You can exchange the order of these two. It holds. It's exactly the same. We, at, the, at the beginning, we had um, the continuous conditional on the um, discrete, but then you needed to make assumption. Uh, and we realized that it was easy, easier to have um, the discrete um, uh, for, uh, the, 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 this way. So this is this joint probability depends on the distribution of this uh, multivariate, uh, or depends on this multivariate distribution. Uh, that's our uh, mathematical formulation. At the end, you have um, um, a, a correlation matrix between the discrete part and the continuous part, the regression, right? So this is discrete and this is the regression. And this is what we are going to estimate at the end in addition to the uh, parameters that comes from the discrete and the continuous part. The bad news is that um, this has no closed mathematical form in the sense that this is a probit. So we needed to solve this. Um, we solved this uh, actually uh, with simulation. And uh, that's um, um, with simulation. And in particular, we use the accept reject uh, algorithm. And this is particularly difficult. There are a no number of uh, computational issues. But at the end, um, this kind of work. All right. Um, this is other stuff that we have done. So instead of using simulation, uh, given that this is just a multivariate uh, normal distribution, uh, we use um, a numerical uh, approximation. As I said, there are people just solving this kind of integrals. And uh, this guy, Gens, uh, he gives you an algorithm to, instead of uh, to approximate um, this multivariate normal. Um, and um, we plugged in this algorithm. And we also tried this method. Uh, I've seen recently other publication in transportation using this. Uh, and uh, actually, it works pretty well in the sense that it's faster and it's more accurate. Uh, however, I would say that this is not, um, this does not avoid simulation. Some simulation is embedded somewhere in this algorithm, which is extremely difficult to understand. But from what we understand, that simulation is there. It's just that it's uh, done in a very good way. Um, and we, we also tried this. We have not published it. Um, we know that it works. I need a time to write this paper. So I think this is also another interesting um, um, field of research, the one of the approximation of this. Instead of using pure simulation, you can use more efficient method by looking at what people in mathematics are doing, for example. 
Um, so we also wanted to compare um, our model, which is using unordered mechanisms with ordered discrete continuous model. And uh, so this is similar to what Fang was doing. Uh, so here, instead of having um, a multinomial logic, we have uh, an ordered, uh, in, instead of having a multinomial probit, we have uh, an ordered probit. And that's what we are doing. Uh, so we have the discrete part, with, which is ordered probit. We have a regression. And uh, we don't have any restriction like Fang does. We just estimate this the normal way you would estimate um, a, um, uh, an ordered probit. The, the, the error of the discrete part and the regression are bivariate normal. And we have a correlation structure here. Uh, the same, this is exactly the same. So this is uh, the probability of regression multiplied by the probability of the discrete part given the regression. So we are conditioning on the, on the, on the, the continuous part. Um, this is the way you write um, the probability. The nice things about this is that you don't need simulation. Um, so um, it's, it's very nice. Um, um, you have a very nice uh, closed mathematical form, and everything becomes easier. So um, um, it's true that um, perhaps the ordered mechanism is not the, the, the best one. But solving this is much easier than solving what I've shown you with multinomial probit. Um, all right, so um, so we 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 saw um, the advantages of the method of Fang that she was using the ordered mechanism because you have this nice log likelihood function and it's much easier to solve the the. The, the one with simulation that we have seen. So let's just see some results here. So can you see the difference between what we are doing and what the others were doing? OK, so now, um, the other difference is that we are using 2009 NHTS. So this is new data. New data, well, it's already four years old, but this was delivered. It takes years to deliver this data. So they collected this in 2009, and we got it, this in 2011. Uh, because my students was always in the office of the lady uh, telling her that we needed the data. So we use data from the Washington DC metropolitan area. This is the place where we live. And we have about 1,500 observation or 1,400 observation. And uh, that's what uh, we have, uh, vehicle holding, vehicle type, and vehicle uh, mileage. So. Um, this and this from National Assault Travel Survey, and this from Consumer Report. You also see the advantage of joining different data set. You needed to work with multiple data set in order to have this comprehensive model estimated. So you, you join a different source of data. Oh, these are the 12, um, altern the t 12 types, right? Small, domestic car, compact, mid-size, large, luxury, uh, mid-size, so sport car, uh, minivan, pickup, and SUV, and 10 vintages from 99 to 2008. Uh, yeah, she has a subsample of choose an alternative plus uh, 20 randomly selected, and that's what I was telling you. So these are a little bit um, statistics. So you see that half of, well, 44% they have two cars. Um, now, the place where we live, there are less cars than in other places because this is anyway a, a quite dense uh, met a metropolitan area. So there are, you see, 7% um, of people without car. This is a quite high number for the United States. So 27% of the people just having one car, uh, and not many people having three or four plus car. So this is kind of our, um, uh, our situation. Uh, the miles, so 10,000 if you have one car, 24,000 if you have two cars, uh, 36,000 if you have four car, and 50,000 if you have more than four cars, four or more than four cars. Uh, in average, uh, you have less than two cars. And in average, they travel about 21,000 miles per year. The age of the car is quite old. It's, it's, I, I would say they are pretty old, these cars, for a number of reasons. Um, for a number of reasons. First of all, because this was uh, just after the 2008 uh, economic crisis, people were holding. 
in the sense that uh, they were not willing to uh, pay for having a new car. So new car was not a priority for them. The other thing is that nothing much has happened in the car industry uh, in the in the car industry in the United States in the sense that if you buy a car now it's not much difference with respect to efficiency to a car that, um, that is 10 years old. So that's for example one of the reason why I don't have a new car in the United States because with respect to efficiency it's exactly the same thing. So this is perhaps telling you something about that these people are going to change their car in the near future. And we, then the question is, which type of car? And can we try to do something in order to have them to buy a smaller car and a more efficient car? Um, this is the estimates that for the vehicle type submodel. You see that here you need to estimate four different models. So you have one model for one car household, one model for the two-car household, three-car households, and four-car households, because um, you needed to um, to calculate the reach of this type model and bring up to the vehicle ownership model. Uh, you see that she was able to calculate uh, purchase pricing for this car, and this is because we had the consumer report, and she has all kinds of, you see, all kinds of variables, shoulder room, luggage space, MPG, uh, these are all, um, all kinds of um, important variables for this. Uh, this, the fit of the model, very good. You see that here uh, we have four, mo so this is the discrete continuous model, right? So this is uh, the model combining decision in one, decision in three, and with the log sum. You see that the log sum is on the top here? Right? The log sum was expected to be between 0 and 1 in order to be consistent with the utility maximization. And that's fortunately what we had. Uh, I, uh, this is kind of two or three months old. Uh, we had a problem calculating the t statistics because um, we were not able to invert the action of this, as I said. Um, when you uh, run a simulation and the model is very complicated, um, the, the action has very poor uh, uh, behavior, uh, and you cannot invert that matrix. You get singular matrix, and there is no way that you can recover the information matrix and the statistics. So we were doing this by using bootstrap. So, and, um, so that's why running bootstrap on a model like this takes a couple of weeks. So that's why she was... Uh, presenting her uh, stuff, and so we don't have all the t statistics now. We have it, so I uh, just didn't have the time to put this into uh, this budget. So what we have here, we have. You see that we have a four. We are comparing four models. The first one is an order discrete continuous model with simulation. It means that this is the probit plus the multinomial probit plus the regression solved with simulation. The second one is the probit plus the multinomial probit, plus regression without simulation or using the Gantz approximation, right? We expect to have almost the same results, uh, but this was easier to estimate. The third one, um, the, the, the fourth one is the same without logsum, and there is a reason for that. It's because we wanted to compare this with ordered mechanism in which uh, it imp it's impossible to calibrate the log sum. So this is another limitation of the ordered mechanism. It was not possible to estimate the log sum. Um, we are not, well, uh, we know why, but um, this was, when we started, we didn't know that. We thought that the log sum can be treated as any other variable. But in reality, <coughs> this model never converged. We have asked also to people like Train and uh, Mannering, but they don't know why this happens. So we we tried to understand why this is happening, but they Mannering said, "Oh, you don't do this. You don't need to do this." And Train says, "Oh, I've never seen that. I need to think about it." Um, okay, I, we don't know, but it's not possible to calibrate. So the other limitation of the ordered mechanism is that if you have the ordered mechanism, you cannot calibrate this. This will stay out of your framework. That's this is another point. Uh, in favor of the unordered mechanism. So this is what we calibrate. Um, we have a number of social demographics. 
uh, income, number of drivers, gender, urban size, um, density. We have also density. And, uh, uh, and this is the discrete part. These are the lambda in the order. You see that? Uh, that's what we have. Um, and we have the, um, the continuous part. You see that we have different variables in the continuous part. We have income, uh, residential density, and driving cost. This is also a very important policy variable. Um, now, uh, there is another problem here about driving cost. So um, cost is um, correlated with uh, um, um, a driving cost is correlated with car ownership. So if you don't take into account this, you have biased coefficient in the sense, remember that I said, um, so there is correlation between driving cost and the uh, dependent variable of uh, the number of cars. So you cannot estimate this directly, but you need a double uh, estimation. So first, you regress cost on some social demographic. Then you derive costs, and then you put back into this model. So there is a description of how the, my students does this, but this is also described in Train and McFadden. Uh, so be careful. You cannot put just cost there, but cost is correlated with um, uh, dependent variables on number of cars. So you need a double uh, estimation of driving cost. Anyway, after we did that, it works nicely. Um, and um, this is what we did. So let's see the log likelihood. OK. Um, so um, this is a little bit better than this. So remember that this is the, the numerical approximation with GANs, and this is simulation. So these are very similar. Coefficients are very similar. But this took um, much less than the simulation. I don't know exactly how less, but it's significantly less. Like simulation takes a couple of days. GANs takes four or five hours. Oh, this models, they take days to be estimated now, the, the way we are doing it. Um, um, this, look at this. So this is much higher than this. So it means that, again, this is confirmed also in our model, is that the ordered mechanism does uh, much worse than the unordered mechanism. So once again, this was nice. This takes um, much less time than this one. But you see that what difference there is between this and this. And also remember that here there is no log sum. So in reality, ne this needs to be compared with this. Because here there is the log sum variable that explains a lot of behavior. Why this is the same model without log sum. But still, this is much superior than that. So this model, uh, this model is much better than this. So again, the unordered mechanism is much better than uh, the ordered mechanism. Okay, so this took us a lot of time, uh, but we are quite pleased with these results. Um, in addition to the estimates, you have this um, uh, covariance matrix. Uh, so you have a full variance covariance matrix estimate. So it means these are the correlation between the this all the discrete alternatives and um, between the continuous and the discrete part. So uh, for example, this is the correlation between alternative 0 and 1, between alternative uh, 1 and 2. So this is the full variance covariance matrix estimated. And this is the, 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 the correlation between uh, the continuous and the discrete part. So we, this is also very nice. You see that um, here is kind of nicely increasing. So um, it means that um, 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 so the more cars you have, the more you drive, right? That's what you expect here. Um, and um, so this is, these are for the four models. This is for the ordered mechanism, right? Remember that there is just one error term. Uh, so you just have the correlation between uh, the discrete part and the continuous part. So you have just one uh, correlation term between discrete and continuous because this is a latent um, a dependent variable estimated. Uh, again, everything worked uh, quite nicely. Um, something that I needed to remind you, and we, we did this wrong the first time we did it. Remember that this is a multinomial probit. 
So everything is done. Um, so you need to normalize this structure. Remember when we did the normalization, maybe on Tuesday? So you cannot estimate everything, but you need to normalize with respect of the utility of the first alternative. So this is normalized. It's finally, application. Um, so we were able to uh, apply the model uh, with respect. We are interested in um, income. So if there is uh, uh, less or more income available in the United States, this is um, density and fuel cost. So what we are seeing is that consistently with what Fang was doing, uh, if you make changes in uh, income, density, and fuel cost, car ownership um, is not very sensible. So there is no way. In the United States, the number of cars is quite it's difficult to change. However, there is hope um, in the, um, when uh, changing the total miles driven. In particular, you see that when you change density, not much, again. So if you increase the density by 50%, the change in vehicles miles driven is just about 5.5%, which is, but anyway. But you can see that people are sensible to fuel cost. So an increase in 50% in fuel cost will cause a minus 18% decrease in the use of car. So this is something that we can do um, and this is not. This was not possible in uh, Fang and Chandrabat model. So, this is what we wanted to estimate. The, fa the, the final changes in uh, vehicles miles driven, uh, given the changes in policy variables. Uh, so we are saying to um, to policymakers in the United States that tax on fuel are more effective than changes in density. They don't like this. Uh, they don't want to hear this. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think, and this is uh, uh, actually consistent with our intuition. The other good news, uh, we are now applying um, uh, the same to the ordered model. And let me see. OK, so remember that this was, um, this has not, this has not um, kind of goodness of fit with respect to the unordered. We say that this was inferior. However, in application, the results are not that different, right? So it is a little bit more sensible to fuel cost, but the rest is very similar. So if you compare this yellow column to this green column, uh, actually, they are not that different. It's true that um, in, um, the goodness of fit was less, but at the end of the day, the results in application don't change much. Uh, and uh, we found this also quite interesting. This is the first part. So, um, this, so this is the conclusion. We think that these uh, joint models of discrete and continuous um, are kind of promising. Uh, they are difficult to estimate, but at the end, it's possible to do it. Uh, and possibly, you know, by implementing these new um, techniques the, of approximation of integrals, maybe this will become easier to do. Uh, we learned a lot out of this. We have a very nice integrated model for car ownership uh, type, vintage, and use. Uh, so we can analyze all these decisions at the same time. Uh, the model is quite powerful because you can uh, test all kinds of policy variables. And um, um, uh, the, the application was it made sense. Um, now. Um, our next steps on this, I would like to sell this to the policymakers in the sense that um, you can integrate this into a four step model uh, or you can use this uh, to predict the greenhouse gas emission um, and all kinds of um, uh, possible applications. So um, uh, that's what we did in uh, discrete continuous. All right. Questions. I've been talking for one and a half hour without um, any break. So now uh, try, let's try to have a little bit of conversation about this and then uh, a break. And then I will show you my other research, which is dynamic discrete choice models. Yes. You know, in the CCA, uh, you have a very good subway system. Yes, that's true. Right? <laughs> yeah, so when you model your data, do you try to consider public transport or the 
the variable or yeah. the interaction between density and the population size? Let me say this. Uh, we have got this question. This is the third time we have the same question. So the first one who asked this was Kai Xausen at the IATVR. The second one was a professor, the Jap a Japanese professor from uh, planning department who is sitting in the PhD committee. It's a very good question. Yes, so I have multiple answers to this. First of all, we tried to uh, put transit, the use of transit in this model, because that can be another very important key variable, policy variable. It didn't work for several reasons, because the only variable we had in, uh, available in NHTS was the use of transit in the last month. So people say, yes, I've been using uh, transit once or twice or uh, 20 times. And actually, there were very few people using transit. <laughs> so we had zero for this variable, I think, in 98% uh, of, the, of the data. So it is true that in, in Washington, we have a good metro, but it's very limited. It's geographically just Washington, D.C. This is the Washington metropolitan area. So it includes um, uh, Maryland, a part of Maryland, a part of Virginia, and D.C. So it is true that the metro is nice, but, but it's not connected. It's just the metro. The place where I live, which is just uh, 30 minutes far from Washington, D.C., I have buses just in the morning, two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. I tried to use it, but after a year, honestly, I gave up. Uh, and um, now, this is one answer. The other is that now we are, um, my students is just working on this, so we want to have, to have better data on transit. And we are using Google data in order to uh, have more transit variables, something that is better than what we have in the National Household Travel Survey. And so we are able, for example, to calculate a distance from the metro station, distance from the bus, connection between the bus and metro. And uh, we want to have all this variable. Uh, actually, she has results. Um, I also have to write the paper, but I've seen the results. And the results are quite nice, actually. So this is another example in which you need to join different sources of data. This is also another, for the students, this is also another important um, thing in transportation. We need to be able to join these different data sets. Out there, there are huge data sets that are just waiting for us to be used. Um, and uh, this is one example in which this needs to be done. Yep. I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, the other yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit, a little bit more about uh, the driving cost? Because like in Taipei, mm. the parking space is very expensive. Yeah. So in your, in your model, did you consider something like this? Uh, no, I don't think so. But you can include this, this into, although let me see, because it's destination specific, right? It's destination specific. Uh, I don't know if. Also. also region? Uh, because like, take it for me as an example, I didn't buy a car because the, the parking is so expensive. So you, you pay, if you buy a car, you need to pay to park close to your house and then at the destination? Ah. Yeah. Two. Two. Mm. Two hmm. yeah. <laughs> How about it? He, mm, uh, um, no, here we have just fuel cost. Um, for parking? No, there is no parking here. Um, I am sure I always account for parking costs when I do more choice. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if parking costs be, maybe in, in car ownership, maybe in that case, he, he, yes, but where do we put this? Uh, in, the, in the cost of driving? Because if you put parking costs here, it will the li it will cancel. Oh, no. You can put also here, because for example, it, suppose that it's this case. You have zero, your case, right? Mm -hmm. No car, one car. You can have the, um, the, the, the cost of the parking here in owning one car. Yes. You can, you can put this here in the car ownership. Yes. But not significantly in the Here? Mm, here, well, we, don't, we have plenty of parking space at home, that's for sure, and for free. <laughs> Um, here, 
could be, but not here, in the sense that we don't choose to have a car uh, based on the park. It's not here. I think it's more in the mode choice for us. Okay. I think. But I need to think about this. Other question? This, yes. Uh -huh. And when we talk about the smart growth, yeah. we, all, we always have to make your state density, diversity, and the design. Uh -huh. So in your study, you concern the land use density, but did you concern the land use mix or no, uh, urban design? No, we have a variable that is called urban somewhere, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Yeah, urban, urban size. Uh, I don't know what she means for that. I think this is a, a rural, um, not quite <coughs> urban, urban, and uh, again, here we just use uh, variables that are available in the National Household Travel Survey, so something that was ready to use. Uh, and actually, um, given that this is quite new, NHTS, they have not elaborated many variables because it takes time for them, for example, to put this into a GIS and have more um, uh, land use variables. Yeah, so, um, the yeah, th so they do this. Um, um, and my students, she, after the transit, she wanted to, maybe she will be able to do both, have transit and uh, GIS data. Uh, she has done this in the past. It's not here, uh, but it can be done by uh, using some GIS uh, and then calculating some land use variables like mixed use or uh, residential or, um, yeah, it, it, it can be included here, but we have not done yet because we were more interested here in the mathematical aspect of this. Now I can do many applications, but until we didn't have this working, it was very difficult to work on other stuff. But she is quite capable, so I think um, she, she will implement this. More yeah, more papers to publish. <laughs> now that we have the machine, now we can publish many papers. I am also curious about the female, the gender value. Ah, uh, yeah. The household survey. So how do you measure the gender? Is household head? Uh, uh, yes, this is, this is uh, household head, okay. yes. Yeah. Well, in, the, um, uh, in this area, we have a number of um, uh, um, uh, female uh, single, uh, 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 yeah, one, yeah, one parent's uh, household. So this is quite significant in that area. And usually it means that they have less money. And so, you know, the, yeah, that's, and you, you can clearly see um, that everything is negative. So this, it's also kind, maybe it's correlated with income. The model is combined the color, shape, and the type, and the vintage yes. choice. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that the case in U.S. In Taiwan, we uh, you uh, household owns more than maybe two cars. They are not simultaneous uh, in one year to purchase these two cars. Oh, that's not, they are sequentially. Yeah, that's the, that's what we do because uh, uh, when you estimate. Um, uh, when you estimate this, in reality, you have more than one, for, oh, well, this is one car, but suppose that you have the two car, right? Yeah. This is your, uh, so here you don't have just the 120 observation. I, maybe, uh, the way I did was misleading, actually. Um, you don't have just the 120, but you have a combination. So you have all possible combinations. So you can have a small car that is two years old, and you can have a large car that is 10 years old. So the, we analyze all the combinations. So the 20 alternatives are drawn from this possible combination. Mm -hmm. But maybe in a, uh, because I've seen there's two cars. One maybe I buy, I buy it three years ago. Yeah. The other is I buy this year. Yeah, then and you can do this. But they uh, face the different condi uh, conditions for the fuel price. Yeah, and that's what we do. So when we compare these alternatives, we compare um, the, all the different options because okay. because we have you see the prices. They compare the prices. They compare the MPG. Uh, maybe the old car is less efficient. The new car is more efficient, and so on. So that's wh exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the usage of uh, the frequency of the usage 
uh, can be considered in this model uh, because uh, uh, one household may honor four car and, and the one mm. uh, you, uh, in, in, this, uh, in the four car only one car can be high frequency use yep. and this model can express this no, uh, this is more the, ca the the models that I've showed uh, from uh, I've shown from Chandrabat and Fang. It's more this kind of model. Now, after this, uh, you can say, well, now I have all these miles. With which car I'm doing this? Then there is another model that we can estimate. For now, we have not done this. So either you do this allocation afterwards, or you do one of the model that you have seen before. So now. You are right, which car I'm using more, uh, because maybe I have four cars, but I'm not using the two of them because they are too expensive or I don't like them. Yeah, but we don't do this here. This is more general planning tool in the sense that you give this to a policymaker and he, he will make his calculation. It's kind of general planning tool. So this is the work of a PhD, uh, one of my, oh, my students is PhD. So I have, in reality, two students working on this. Uh, I have this um, Chinese lady uh, that she did all the data and estimation, but I have a statistician behind this. So a statistician who has been implementing all this discrete continuous stuff. And um, this, um, I think he has the software available in his website, and it's in R for now. Um, and um, so now we are taking two directions out from this. Uh, first of all, we want to publish a number of papers uh, on um, like the kind of paper on transit and land use, more of application of this, try to learn out of this. Uh, we want to use this as a national model. For example, another application of this is um, people in the United States are interested to know the difference between behavior in very urban er in urban area against <coughs> rural areas, and the application of this to um, calculate greenhouse gas emission, and um, also using census variables. So they want to use census variables in order to improve the prediction of this. Mm -hmm. So we want to do this. Um, I want to uh, use this for greenhouse gas emission, and this will be another PhD thesis, hopefully. Uh, I have a student coming from Cornell, so I want her, uh, she's Chinese, but she did a master in Cornell. I want her to do this. And also all the mathematical aspect of this. There is plenty of mathematical situation behind this that should be investigated. So this, I think, is going to keep me busy for the next couple of years. So. Let's do the last hour for this week. OK, so um, so with my group, um, we have been working on um, discrete continuous model. But uh, at the same time, uh, we are also working on the new concept of uh, discrete choice models, uh, which I think are um, really new in transportation, in the sense that if discrete continuous, there are other examples. Um, you, I have never seen example of dynamic discrete choice models um, in transportation. So uh, there are examples in the um, economic literature. Actually, they were developed uh, first proposed by um, John Rust, who is a very famous professor in economics. Uh, actually, was also a student of Daniel McFadden. But um, there are many applications in um, in economics, but not much in transportation. I don't exactly know why. Uh, maybe because they thought uh, they were too difficult to apply. <laughs> um, and again, um, uh, well, this three hours will be all about vehicle holdings. Um, um, uh, but I have other application in revenue management. Maybe uh, on Wednesday, if. Uh, if we have time, uh, I will show you something from uh, our work in revenue management. I think uh, I will be able to show just uh, these slides here. So what is, what is a dynamic discrete choice model? So we have seen some dynamic models, right? Um, models that are calibrated on panel data, which account for decision over certain uh, times, uh, period of time. 
Uh, I've showed you uh, how to handle panel data with Probit, with Mixed Logit. There are also a number of Logit variables calibrated with lagged variables, right? We, we, we have seen that. We have seen that we can make the choice, our choices, dependence on previous choices or previous um, value of the attributes. These are kind of called dynamic discrete choice models, but it's not really what people in economics intend for discrete choice models, for dynamic discrete choice models. Uh, so my um, idea, um, what I'm going to do is I want to show what I mean for dynamic discrete choice models and how we have adapted the results from economics into transportation. Why I need it, why I wanted to develop dynamic discrete choice models. Um, so I thought that in the United States, you have seen that the, 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 the cars are quite old, people are kind of e on hold, they are waiting. They, are, they want to see if something new is going to happen, and so in the meantime, they are kind of holding their own car. Uh, so I wanted to, to be able to study the impact of new vehicle technology, so I wanted to be able to see if, for example, um, technology that improves significantly MPG will affect vehicle ownership. If technology, new technology like hybrid cars, electric cars, uh, will affect the people, the way people buy new cars. Um, and so all this, so new vehicle technology means new, uh, new cars with um, uh, more efficient RPG or uh, means um, hybrid cars or electric cars in the market. Or for example, also means that fast racing fuel prices um, um, will happen in the United States. We had this actually in 2008. So when I arrived in the United States, that was 2006, uh, fuel price was $2 per gallon. In 2008, it was $4 per gallon. So it was exactly the double. And um, I remember people, I remember my students saying, sorry, today I'm not going to school because I don't have the money to fuel my car. Or I remember people at the gas station saying, geez, $50 just half of my tank. So this kind of effect. Uh, and there was actually a decrease in um, fuel usage. I think it was about 5%. And there was a decrease uh, in uh, the people traveling by plane. So everything was more expensive and people were kind of scary. Now we are back to three, three and a half dollars, nobody cares. Um, so um, I started this and um, so I had two problems for this. I needed to collect the data because um, when with this, these are situations that they do not exist in the market, right? So I didn't have data. I could not use NHTS. So this was data about future. Uh, I had no data. Uh, nobody had the data. So I had to think about how to collect the data. And also, I wanted a new modeling framework that was able to handle this. Because as you would see, this gives a number of theoretical problems that are not possible to solve with just static discrete choice models. Uh, first of all, we started with data collection. So I wanted to collect the data on future household vehicle preferences in Maryland. And in particular, I had three objectives in mind. The first objective was vehicle technology. Uh, so were people willing to buy new cars and which type of cars, in particular new gasoline car, new electric cars or new hybrid cars. So there was a type choice car. Um, then um, I wanted uh, to be able to see if I could collect uh, dynamic behavior using stated preference uh, techniques. Uh, and also, um, I wanted to um, be able to see if people were kind of able to um, make choices under very um, hypothetical conditions. But you will see what I mean. It's difficult to explain. OK, so that's the kind of uh, definition we are using. So we are um, exploring battery electric vehicles, hybrid electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, alternative fuel uh, vehicles, uh, flexible fuel vehicles, and MPG is miles per gallon. What 
this out there uh, in the literature review. Uh, so I will explain next year what is a stated preference, which are the techniques for the stated preference data collection. But we had in mind, we had a couple of references. Uh, so in 93, when there was another kind of uh, fuel crisis, uh, people were studying this. And this is, uh, I think, a very good paper, which um, was written by a number of uh, famous people. Bunch, Bradley, and Kitamura. Kitamura, I, you know Professor Kitamura? Professor Kitamura was a um, Japanese professor who worked in the United States for about 20 years. And then he, and he passed away, unfortunately. Uh, but he was a very bright guy. And um, uh, he introduced many of things that we are still using. So in 1993, he published a paper in which he, can, he conducted a stated preference survey in California. Uh, I will say that California is the state as the, the, um, as the most innovative policy regarding car ownership. They, develop, they were the first to develop a, a car ownership model. Everything Train has done um, and McFadden have done, they have done this in California. They had huge money for research, and this was a topic uh, highly um, studied. So they first suggested the use of stated preference data collection to study vehicle choice, and in particular, their problem was very similar to mine. So they, had, uh, um, they wanted to collect data about new, gasol the, um, new gasoline vehicles, alternative fuel vehicle, and flex fuel or electric vehicles. So you see that 20 years ago, uh, the problem was there. Uh, it's just that in the meantime, uh, we forgot about this. I think mainly because uh, fuel price, fuel cost was very inexpensive. So that's why we forgot all this alternative uh, vehicle uh, car, alternative vehicles. Uh, and also you wanted to analyze not just vehicle choice, but also fuel choice, right? At that time, they had available multinomial logit and acid logit, and they used it. Um, then, um, well, Kitamura worked, worked in Davis, and um, you know, uh, uh, Sperling is also another, um, it's not very known amongst modelers, but he's um, a planner, a professor in planning, and they have a, a center um, in, uh, in Davis. Actually, he's part of the team who won the Nobel Prize with um, Al Gore um, about, um, you know, all, Al Gore won the Nobel Prize because of his uh, environmentally, and he was one of the team who wrote a book with Al Gore, and so these 20 people won the Nobel Prize with him. And so he has also a number of studies. They are more descriptive. It's not about modeling, but he's interesting in uh, analyzing um, behavior with regards to vehicle type and fuel choice. Um, you see that people are starting again to work on this, in particular, Kara Kockelman. She has done um, um, some data collection, and, um, and so she has collected some stated preference data about 12 vehicle alternatives of varying size and technology, estimated an MNL model, and also she has projected this, this in the future using simulation. So she projects the population in the next 25 years, and then she's able to, cal to calculate uh, vehicle choice based on the model. So you see that the temporal dimension is there, because you collect data at one point in time, and you want to project this into the future. So you want to be able to say what's happening to vehicle ownership and to vehicle type in five years, in 10 years. Or she's interested in a period of 25 years, which is usually um, the, the time period that you use um, when you apply uh, a four-step model, right? You want to be able to forecast what's happening in 20 years, in 30 years. But there are, um, these are kind of more uh, modeling-focused paper in the sense that they, ad they use advanced and discrete choice models, that's what we are doing here, uh, to car ownership. And in particular, Brownstone and Train, they use mixed logic and probit uh, to estimate preferences among gasoline, electric, methanol, and uh, CNG vehicle. And they use uh, mixed logit with error component. Uh, this is one of the few applications of mixed logit with error component. Why this is because they had a, a very high number of alternatives, and these alternatives were very much correlated. So they showed that if you use MNL, 
um, you over predict um, the, um, the choice of electric vehicles. Why this? Because electric vehicles are in general small, so they are highly correlated with small cars. And so if you use just MNL, given the IIA hypothesis, you over predict uh, the choice of electric vehicles. Uh, so they said if you use mixed logic with error component, you, are more, you, you get more credible, more flexible substitution patterns across alternatives. So this is a very nice application of mixed logic with error component. And it's really one of the few I know. Then uh, Dennis Bolduc, who was uh, a postdoc um, at MIT uh, with uh, Ben Akib and now is a professor in uh, Laval, uh, Canada. He has worked with um, a good student and friend of mine, uh, Riccardo Daziano, and they, are, um, they have done a lot of work on car ownership with latent variables. So they claim that uh, your choice of buying a new car is driven by the fact that you have maybe some environmental concerns. And uh, we don't know how to measure the environmental concerns, right? I don't know. Um, if uh, my friend who is buying a new car is concerned about how much he's emitting, if he's concerning about uh, consuming less, and so on. So he says that in order to model this, this environmental concerns, you need to use hybrid choice model. So as I said, this is very popular nowadays. Uh, people are talking about this all the time. So um, latent variables are kind of used um, a lot to model vehicle ownership. Um, and actually, latent variables are already implemented into uh, Biogen. So they are ready to use. If you want to use them, they are, you can use Biogen. It's, it's, they are there. I think that's one of the reasons why they are also so popular, because the implementation has already been done. Um, so these are recent, well, recent, uh, but I think very good example on how to use advanced discrete choice modeling for vehicle ownership. Back to our problem, so we decided um, with a student of mine to write our own software. I will show you the software today to collect data. And we decided to use that software to collect data in Maryland. So that's what we did. Um, this is kind of in-house. Um, in house effort in the sense that we did everything by yourself from the software to the data collection to the model estimation and um, and without money <laughs> so this was really um, done um, uh, because we wanted to have some results to show and in fact just after this we got the fantastic uh, National Science Foundation grant and now we have the money uh, to do the real um, we are ready to do a real data collection so this is kind of Consider this a pilot, right? So we did this ourselves. We spent our weekends collecting data, and at the end, uh, we got the data. We are still debating about this because uh, we needed to tell people that uh, the choices that we were collecting were choices in the future. So, you know, it's very difficult to make people realize it, making choice in the future. So we gave a couple of indications. We said to the people, make realistic decision. If you are, um, so act like you were buying a car in real life. This is, we know that this is not true, but act like, pretend that you are buy, um, willing to buy a car in the future. Uh, take account the situation presenting during the scenarios. And um, uh, if you think that you are not going to buy, they say, no, I'm not buying. Uh, assume that your income is increasing, but not uh, increasing that much in the future. So we said to the people, um, be realistic. So this is, OK, so this is the stated preference. So we had a couple of these. In particular, we had the three of these experiments. So I will show you in detail what is a stated preference next week. But this is, gives you a good indication of the scenarios that we propose to individuals. So we were saying, um, suppose that this was 2010, right? So we said, suppose that in 2012, the following vehicle characteristics are available in the market. And we said, uh, this is your own vehicles, because they revealed to us which was the current vehicles that we, they were using. So uh, we were interviewing a person. Uh, we said, describe us your own vehicles. And these were the characteristics of their own vehicles. Then we said, suppose that in 2012, there is a new gasoline vehicle available. 
there is an hybrid vehicle available and there is an electric vehicle available with some characteristics, right? So they had different prices. Um, so, um, um, well, um, this was much more expensive than the gasoline vehicle. This was kind of the same. The MPG of this um, was higher than this. Uh, this was the range between refueling, um, this was vehicle emission, and this was the vehicle size. And we said, well, make a choice. And the possible choices were, I will keep my current vehicles, I will buy a new vehicle and which type of vehicle. Um, I will buy a new vehicle in addition to what I already have. So I will add a new vehicle to my um, household uh, um, car uh, fleet, and then um, I will sell my car, and I won't care about uh, my uh, I won't care about car anymore. Um, not surprising, in all our data set, nobody chose this, so nobody gave up his car. Um, so this was the experiment that we call vehicle technology. You see, that was my objective: see if new cars become available on the market. <coughs> What is going to happen? And in particular, we were playing a lot with MPG. We wanted to see if um, MPG was relevant or not in their choices. Um, so these were all the variables in, uh, of interest in our case. The second one. The second one was fuel type. Uh, this is was similar to what Bunch and Kitamura were doing in 93. So we said, well, this is gasoline fuel, this is alternative fuel, this is diesel and this is electricity. These are the characteristics. What would you choose, right? And we were playing a lot with um, vehicle pr uh, with fuel price. Actually, I wanted this fuel price to go up, up, up to um, ten dollar per gallon. Although my students he refused to do that, and they said no. Uh, Maximum, I think, here is $6 per gallon, which was about twice as much as the price in 2009. Um, and also, we divided the fuel tax, uh, fuel efficiency. Not surprising, this experiment didn't work very well. And I think there is a reason, because people they do not believe in this. They think that the fuel price will stay like that. and. They have, really, there is no sensitivity to fuel price in the United States. They don't know what it means pay high price for, for fuel. It's just out of their imagination. So we tried. Um, we have some results, um, but they are not um, as good as the results we got for the first experiment. Oh, um, important thing. So this is varying over time. So people got different of this. In particular, they got 12 of this. Each for each, uh, e one for each six months. So it means that this was fall 2010. So we said in spring 2011, this is what you'll get. In fall 2011, this is what you'll get. So over five years, we made the technology changing. So we gave a new option and possibly better option with respect to technology. We gave higher, fewer prices. Uh, with respect to fuel, um, tech, uh, fuel type experiment. And also, we introduced new taxation policy. We were interested in a uh, uh, number of uh, policy. For example, income tax credit. So, and this is, in rea this is a true policy in the sense that for a number of years in the United States, if you buy hybrid or if you uh, buy an electric car, you got some uh, tax back. So at the end of the year, you declare that you bought a new uh, electric vehicle, and you got back uh, a significant amount of money. In fact, I think this, it was $5,000 at that time. But uh, there is a lot of debate about this. Uh, people say that it's a waste of money. This, uh, so sometimes there is this credit, sometimes there is not. Uh, so we had this. Um, Oh, then we introduced toll because um, um, you know uh, in, in Maryland they are introducing um, highway with toll. They they they, they built um, an intercounty connector and you pay toll there. Uh, and the people are saying that, for example, if you have an electric car, um, uh, you pay less or you pay nothing uh, on this uh, with respect to toll. So this is a policy, and. Um, 
and also um, some states are debating about introducing a um, fee based uh, on uh, so kind of you pay the insurance based on the mileage you travel so the more you travel the more you pay uh, and Oregon is very much interested in this kind of policy but again there is no there is no data about this we don't know how people will react uh, with respect to this so this the contribution that my students is claiming that we are making um, these are kind of the descriptive statistics this is our sample so what this is this saying this is saying that uh, first of all we are um, oversampling people with high income uh, actually uh, the place where we live uh, there are very well well it's close to the university so it's uh, there are people who are very well educated people who are making a lot of money so this we were many people with high income uh, vehicle ownership was fine was about two this is the magic number in the united states uh, the, the vehicle age was again i think quite fine was about six years um, the, the, um, the primary vehicle price was uh, 23,000 if the vehicle was new and was 10,000 if the vehicle was used. Maybe this is a little bit high uh, and this correlated with the fact that we had high income people. And look at this. So we had 62% of the uh, sample saying that yes, they intend to purchase a new ve a vehicle in the next five years. So my hypothesis is that people at that time were just waiting to see what was available in the market was in fact true. Uh, because people were saying, well, uh, in the United States, the Americans are not interested in buying a vehicle anymore. And this was what we got. So many people were in fact on the market waiting to see what was going to be new in the market. I, I was quite pleased with this result. All right, so that's the kind of um, data I wanted to collect. So I wanted to see how people, if people were interested to buy um, vehicles, depending on, uh, for example, the, the, the price of this vehicle, right? So we have intended to buy a vehicle and which type of vehicle and with the price. So these were the price of gasoline vehicle, uh, hybrid vehicle, and electric <coughs> vehicles. So this, and you see that you have, we have a dynamic behavior. We have data over um, a time period of six years. Uh, so you see that the intention to buy electric was increasing because we were giving uh, attributes that were better for electric vehicles over time. You know, uh, many new station to uh, charge your car, uh, uh, less price. It's what we imagine can happen in the next five years. Maybe we were too optimistic, but you know, we are not interested in real number here. We are just interested in a, a total behavior. We wanted to experiment. So I won't trust this number. So don't look at the numbers here. Uh, look at the methodology. Uh, again, um, this was also very interesting because you see that people were interested in a plug-in hybrid vehicle with fuel price going up. This is um, fuel price, right? Going up up to six dollar per uh, gallon, and so they were more and more interested in new plug-in hybrid vehicles as pricing was going up. This is with taxation, so we intru introduced at one point without any warning and VMT taxation here and you see that after a while they realized that having an electric car and not paying VMT was very interesting and so they so I think this is optimistic but again people were able to um, sense this new policy and react that's what we wanted here but again don't look at the numbers these are over prediction for sure. So the main objective here was data collection. I wanted to see if we were able to capture dynamic behavior over time because I needed this data for the model I had in mind. So my main objective was just to be able to collect the data. Um, and then given that we had the data, my students calibrated a number of mixed logic and we published this paper. So um, this is pr paper production. <laughs> 
anyway, uh, we did uh, a mixed logic, and we had uh, a mixed logic with both random parameters and error component. So the specification that we have seen on Wednesday successfully a number of um, parameters. So you see that, uh, for example, it, is, it had a random parameters on the equal size, and this is the double. The standard deviation is the double of the mean. It means that half of the people prefer. Um, uh, uh, small vehicles and half of the people they prefer um, large vehicles. So there is a, a, a heterogeneity in the population. He had um, two error components. So he was he had under one nest non-electric vehicles and non-hybrid vehicles in one nest. Uh, these were highly significant. Uh, this was kind of um, doing the same that Brownstone and um, Train were doing in their paper. Uh, we had all kinds of variables estimating. Oh, another thing uh, that we found very interesting, and this is important in the United States because this is a fuel economy or MPG. So if people, uh, you see that we have two coefficients here, interacted with the fact that they knew the current MPG or not. So it means I ask the people, do you know how, much, um, how many miles you can drive with a gallon? And they said, I have no idea. Other people, they said, yes, I know. Uh, it's about 25 miles per gallon, or it's about 30 miles per gallon. So there were different class of people. We interacted with that variable with, uh, um, with um, uh, MPG. And we discovered that pe for people who didn't know how much they are consuming per gallon, this variable was not important. And for people who, who knew that, this variable was important. And I think this was a very interesting result, because it means that uh, for some people, MPG is just doesn't matter in the United States. For example, in Italy, MPG is the first thing that you look at, because fuel price is very expensive. Um, anyway, so we had a number of interesting variables. The model was um, successfully estimated. Um, we have a very few observation. So we have 83 individuals each giving 12, um, uh, responding 12 scenarios. So we had 1,000 observation. Uh, it's low, but um, again, we, we were not using these numbers. We wanted just to test if it was possible to collect the data and estimate a meaningful, meaningful model. Uh, we had another model estimating from the second experiment. Uh, this is what we get, again, again mixed logic with both error component and um, random coefficient. Not bad. Gasoline price, well, all the prices were negative. Um, uh, vehicle age was negative and so on. This didn't work very well, but at the end we also had a taxation policy. So, for example, toll discount, again, for households who were near toll facilities, near it means near to this uh, intercounty connector, this was significant. It was not significant for those who were very far away from the toll facility. Uh, so they had no experience about paying toll uh, for using the highway. So this was about um, the data. We want to, uh, actually we are in the process of redesigning the survey and uh, I needed to write an email to my students and tell them that we needed to run this survey now. But uh, data collection was not my main objective. My main objective, uh, given that I work with models, was have a framework for dynamic discrete choice model, uh, in the sense that you will see that. So uh, the motivation, uh, as I said, the discrete choice models are used in transportation mainly in a static context, right? We, we say it. Uh, what you have seen from NHTS, um, the choices that we model are, uh, you know, in 2009, uh, how many cars you had. Uh, in 2009, uh, which type of car you had. And in 2009, how many miles your, uh, you have driven your car. So it means that it's static, right? The data, both the data and the model is for 2009. Although you use that data to make projection in the future, but you don't, you make projection, but you don't know exactly um, when these choices are going to happen. It, they depend on variables, but it's not time dependent. 
and uh, well uh, I was expecting to see um, well in the case we something really new will happen we have no forecasting techniques that take into account time um, and choices so, as I said dynamic discrete choice models have been developed in economics and um, the, the main idea behind dynamic discrete choice models are that agent or household individuals so all the people we are modeling are forward-looking agent in the sense that when I'm making choices what what does it mean forward-looking it means that when I'm making a choice now I have a utility for the choices that I'm making but I also have expectation about the future for example uh, if you are a student I have expectation that in five years uh, my income will be higher so I have expectation about my future or for example in the, in the case that I'm waiting to see if a new vehicle is coming in the market I'm not just taking into account my utility now but I also have expectation for future utility for the fact that for example a very nice car will become available in three years so instead of just accounting for my utility now I also have expectation about my future utility that's what the means of forward-looking agent and there is another thing that I'm maximizing expected intertemporal payoff. So I'm maximizing not just my utility now, but I'm maximizing my utility now plus an expectation of utility in the future. Right? So, so far, we have just seen I'm maximizing utility now. We, we have never considered in the utility an expectation about the future. Another thing is that um, when I make choices in the classical uh, static discrete choice modeling framework, I consider the, um, the value of the attributes, right? I know I'm supposed to know the cost, I'm supposed to know the price, I'm supposed to know uh, uh, the fuel cost, the purchasing price of the car, so it's kind of you know, I know these numbers. I know that there are errors on these numbers. All the errors are in my epsilon, but I assume that these numbers are known. However, when you introduce, um, when you have calculate expectation, it kind of these variables are not really known, but are kind of come from a different. It, they are not numbers, but are something different. We'll see how we model that. Uh, so as a result of all this, at each time period, uh, a consumer can do two things. Decide to buy. So at each time period, if, I'm, uh, if I have um, available these cars, for example, now uh, I have available a certain gasoline vehicle, I have available an electric vehicle, and I have a, a hybrid vehicle, I can decide, okay, it's time for me to buy, and I buy. Or I can say, well, let's wait a little bit because I'm sure that in five years the electric vehicles will be much better. So given that my car is still working, um, let's just wait. So the decision now, it's not just uh, which kind of car I buy, but it's am I going to buy a car or I'm going to wait and see what happens in the future. Um, so this is the dynamic. So there are two dynamics here going on. One is the forward-looking agent that is um, as just not one utility, but also an expected utility. And there are variables uh, changing over time kind of randomly. So let's see how we do that. Uh, we looked at the literature in economics. There is a lot out there. So this is uh, not. Uh, a comprehensive literature review. Uh, there, is, there is a lot. Uh, these papers are extremely difficult to read. Uh, it took us, uh, it took my students, uh, my poor first PhD students, she arrived and she had to go through this. She had no idea. She was kind of lost. Um, so uh, at the end, she decided to focus on these uh, four, four, five papers. Uh, but in 2010, so we did this before 2010, we did this um, in 2007, 2008, but in 2010, people in economics, they published uh, a very good literature review paper. So now, um, 
it will be much easier for her <laughs> to do the literature review. And um, uh, so it's in the Journal of Econometrics or Journal of Applied Econometrics. It's a very good literature. I need to read it, but it's 50 pages. So just the literature review is 50 pages. Uh, but we thought that this paper were um, good enough for us. Actually, when um, every time we publish on this, the reviewer says, you know, there is much more out there. I, we understand this, but uh, this is what we needed. So these papers, they gave us the framework that we wanted to construct. So the seminal paper for dynamic discrete choice models is the paper from John Rust. Actually, John Ratz was a professor in economics at Maryland. I didn't know that when I started this, but he was just out there. And he gave uh, for us the, um, uh, I organized a workshop in Maryland in January about this. And he gave us the introductory lecture. It was wonderful. He gave one hour lectures um, on a transportation related problem. And we had a very nice discussion with him. He, he did a very good job. So John Ratz, in his thesis in 87, he had this problem. He had a bus engine replacement problem in which he, he was analyzing choices uh, of a, a bus operator. He had one bus operator. And this bus operator had the different buses. And his decision was, am I going to replace the engine of the bus, or am I going to get rid of this bus and buy a new bus? So this problem was a bus engine replacement but this problem was dynamic because it was over time, a very long period of time. He had the real data about this. And, but the problem was, in reality, quite simple because there was just one person deciding. It was the bus operator. So he had no social demographic characteristic, right? He had no heterogeneity across the population. It was one person, one, peop one guy deciding. He had just two options. Um, uh, keeping the engine or replacing the engine. He had homogeneous attributes of the product because it was always a bus. He had no different cars. He had a bus. It was always the same bus. He had an infinite horizon because uh, unless this, this guy was going out of the market, he had always that problem, right? So infinite horizon. This is also a difference with our problem because remember that I collected data over six years. So I have a finite horizon problem, while he has an infinite horizon problem. And this makes a lot of difference the way we are calibrating the model. And given that he has an infinite horizon problem, he was calibrating a nested fixed endpoint method to, um, for estimation. Now, uh, I want, now I have some results, but I want to go back with these students and mine on this. Uh, because I needed to understand well uh, what he is doing and um, how our model is different from what he was doing. So uh, this will be uh, my uh, research topic for uh, next year. I have a project with a mathematician, so we want to do this. OK, so this was for us the base of our um, research. Now, um, John Graff's model has been applied and improved over the time. And we said, well, let's see what other people have done, and let's see if we can get the idea. So I found um, a PhD thesis unpublished, which is from Melnikov. Uh, and he was analyzing a printer machine demand. Um, and um, it was interesting because um, the characteristic of this printer machine were varying over time. So this printer machine were improving over time. And this was similar to our problem because, for example, suppose the electric car problem, we suppose that the, the characteristic of the electric uh, car are improving over time. And we don't know exactly how they will improve over time. So there is a random process there that needs to be modeled. So um, actually, I really liked this. The paper is not well written. It's, um, in, in fact, has never published. The idea is nice, but the paper is not quite ready. Uh, then um, there was an extension of the Melnikov paper. And this is kind of, um, uh, this was about operating system. And the choice there was, uh, um, am I going to um, buy a new operating system, or am I going to upgrade my operating system? We actually don't exactly do this for now in our model, but this is an idea. Because, for example, you can choose to repair your car instead of buying a new car, right? But we don't do this. 
And the other thing that is interesting is that he has an acid logic. Uh, the other people, they don't have an acid logic. We don't have an acid logic. But sooner or later, if you want to make this framework um, uh, general, you need to do an acid logic in this. And actually, um, this was, uh, we have this paper under review and uh, almost accepted. And the, the, is, the, the reviewer said, well, you just have a logic. And we said, yes, we know, but it's already quite complex. Um, then um, there is uh, another paper. This is published. Um, and this is kind of dynamic mixed logic, right? So he has heterogeneity over consumer preferences. And in fact, he estimates a kind of mixed logic, but then uh, again, we don't have this for now uh, because you need simulation on the top of dynamic discrete choice models, which is very complicated. But in the long term, we uh, hopefully will do. And uh, another interesting thing here from this other paper is uh, repeated purchases. It means maybe this is not really a problem for, uh, for car ownership. But uh, if you buy um, other product, you can buy repeatedly over time. For example, you buy a computer now, then you buy another computer in three years, and another computer maybe after two years. So it's more important for this kind of problem in economics than for us. Because if you buy a car next year, it's very unlikely that you buy another car in three years. Well, maybe in the States, yes, but it's, it, you know, it's not uh, the main problem that we have. Although. We, we do this now. We, we account for this. OK, so these were the idea. Now the formulation. Uh, this is, these are the slides of my students. They are not the optimal uh, slides, but uh, let's try to see. Now, um, first of all, the first difference between a static discrete choice model and dynamic discrete choice model is the definition of a status variable. So it means that. Um, um, uh, you have this status variable, so which is 0 and 1. And uh, 0 means that you are in the market. For example, uh, it can mean different things. For example, um, can mean, um, you remember that we uh, asked the people, are you willing to buy a new car in the next five years? And they said, 62% of them, they said, uh, yes, I'm, I'm willing to buy a car. So this 62% are kind of 0. They are in the market. Maybe the, uh, the other 38% can be out of the market or can be also considered in the market. Because uh, you, know, you can say now, no, I'm not going to buy um, a car in the next five years. But then suddenly something changes. For example, you have a baby and you want a car. And this was not expected. So, um, so it, the definition of this is troublesome. And one is otherwise. And this is um, important, especially when um, when you consider one purchase at the time, so because when you buy, then you are out. You are not in the market anymore. And this may be the problem of car ownership. You buy a new car, and for the rest of the time period, you are out. So this is the state variation. The state variable. Um, now, uh, so the state variable for individual uh, i at time t, right? OK, now, if you are in the market, so if you have SIT equal to 0, you have two options. Which are these options? You can buy a product, right? So you say, well, yes, I'm willing to buy a car. You can buy a car for, for, for real. And then you need also to decide which type of car. So you decide to buy, and then you decide which type. Or you have another option, and this is different from what we have seen so far. The other option is I'm not buying now, but I'm postponing my decision. So I'm going to the next time period and see what happens. Right? So you have two choices, buy and then be out or postpone. Uh, in both cases, you, have, um, you receive a utility. Um, if you are in A, you obtain a terminal payoff, because you buy something and then you are out, bye-bye. <coughs> or you, um, um, you obtain a one-period payoff. You, you obtain a utility for this time period, right? And that we call CIT. Or uh, the terminal payoff is you 
IJT. Um, one period payoff, again, it's an utility, and it depends on um, attributes of the individual at time t, for example, gender, education, income, and so on. But it also depends on the characteristic of your own vehicle now, right? Uh, so it depends on the age of the vehicle, on the uh, mileage of this vehicle, on the fashion pricing, and so on. And then, and then you have, um, like in, uh, in all the models, parameters to estimate with x uh, and q. The terminal payoff. Um, here, uh, you have a vector of static attributes, well, um, and dynamic attributes. So you have, for example, again, the characteristic of the individuals and the characteristic of the car. But you also have dynamic attributes, what we, what we call dynamic attributes. For, and these are all these uh, variables that are expecting to change a lot over time. For example, few, uh, the, the cost of the car, of the new car, or the fuel uh, price. So we divide this into two parts. And um, this is uh, the utility, right? So we have UIJT uh, and we have um, C. So this is uh, the one period payoff. This is the terminal payoff that has both static and dynamic variable. This is the formulation. Um, so in reality now, the utility is not just the utility, but it contains this two utility, right? Um, so, um, in reality, in this dynamic problem, I'm maximizing between two things. One is the utility of buying, which is this knee IT, and the other one is the utility of postponing, right? Because the first term is that this is the utility of buying something now, and then I'm out. The second term is the utility of postponing. And why this utility of postponing is like this? Because the utility of postponing is, if I'm postponing, what happens is that um, um, I have a one period payoff because I'm happy enough with my car. Uh, you know, my car is working. My, I don't have to spend a lot of money on my car. Uh, and also, so this is the CIT. But I also have an expectation about the future because it means that I'm positive. I'm, I'm saying there will be something better in two years. So I'm also obtaining a kind of utility from the fact that something uh, good will happen in the future, right? Um, OK, so me, this, uh, this, I don't know, me, how it's called, it's the max over UJT because um, you are buying one of these cars, right? So you are buying something. And this utility is, comes from the fact that you maximize your utility. It's like logic, right? You buy one of these cars, and your utility of buying depends on the max utility across all these uh, alternatives. So C is the payoff when postponing. Uh, this is kind of, this beta, we should call this, it's kind of um, uh, discount factor because all this utility should, should be calculated over different time period. If it is a very long time period, you should account for a kind of discount factor that can be calibrated in the model. For now, we are not calibrating this. We are assuming that this is equal to 1. Of, you, you will see that we are making a number of simplification. It's just because we wanted this framework working. And also what is very different is uh, this expected utility here, right? We, we have never seen expected utility in discrete choice models, right? Never. Um, OK, so formulated this way, um, this is um, a classical dynamic programming problem, uh, which is solved in classical liter in the literature with the Bellman equation. Again, this is not us. This is John Rust who proposed this. So that is the contribution of John Rust. So he kind of mixed discrete choice models with dynamic programming. And uh, he had a dynamic programming formulation using discrete choice model, right? So. Um, um, so you maximize this now, right? Uh, and um, tau, 
um, is um, the time period when consumer decide to buy. So the assumption here is that there is an optimal time period in which uh, you decide to buy. And this is because, uh, actually it's this, the max between this and this. Um, and you decide to buy when this first term is greater than the second term, right? Because the utility, you decide to buy. So the, the optimal time period when you decide to buy is when the utility of buying becomes greater than the utility of postponing. It makes perfect sense, right? Um, now we are calling this uh, W, which we, well, we are making some calculation here. And we say that this is called W, which is the reservation utility. It's the, the utility of um, not buying, reservation, right? Staying with your, um, um, with your uh, product. And then uh, we, we calculate, oh, uh, this is the, the main difference within our framework and uh, John Rust's framework. We do this in maximum likelihood estimation. We don't use this nested fixed point algorithm that is used by, if I understand well, by 90% of the people in economics. Uh, and also the, when he presented us his research, he's still using nested fixed point algorithm. In, while we don't do that, we just calculated the probability of postponing, uh, you know, that's what we call zero. It's postponing, staying with my, um, staying with my product when a knee is less than the reservation utility. This is just saying that the utility of buying is less than utility of um, um, staying with my product. So this is the utility of postponing. And then once uh, we have this, uh, we can calculate the uh, probability of buying like 1 minus pi 0 t, right? The probability of buying will be 1 minus the probability of not buying. And once we have this, we can calculate the probability of buying a particular product or a particular car by multiplying by just, this is logic. It's, it's badly written, but this is logic. Uh, so it's just um, the adoption rate uh, multiplied by um, uh, the probability of buying one type of car. Remember that I said that um, some of the um, um, attributes are not static but are dynamic, so we need to specify uh, these Y terms that are dynamic. We call this, also we had a lot of trouble explaining this, but the idea is that um, we want to represent the evolution of the industry, like uh, the fact, for example, that um, the electric car is becoming less expensive. It's because the, the, the industry is um, is, is progressing, and so they can produce more electric cars at lower cost. So you need to imagine this, or this can be, for example, um, uh, fuel costs increasing over time. So uh, this is evolving in, uh, in, 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 uh, in a bad sense, in the sense that fuel price will become more and more expensive in the future, but we don't know exactly how. So we represent all these dynamic variables with random walk. And in particular, we say that the dynamic variables are supposed to follow a normal diffusion process uh, and is specified with the random work. You see that uh, the value of y for product j at time uh, t plus 1 is function of uh, the value of this in the previous um, time period plus uh, a Cholesky um, factor of the variance covariance matrix. And we have done this with, um, we, have, we have calibrated this. This is kind of um, a random work. You can calibrate this random work. It's a kind of a normal diffusion process. And actually, my student has calibrated this uh, on fuel prices um, for the last 30 years. And we have a very nice random work. You can see that these prices are all correlated over time. And you can nicely project all these fuel prices over time. So we, we did a trial. We said, let's see if, because you know, we have, we have never seen this done before. We wanted to kind of make sure that we were doing stuff that ma made sense. Uh, and so uh, we have done this both for fuel price, and uh, we have calibrated this uh, for um, the price of electric vehicles on our city preference data. It didn't work so nicely on our own data, but anyway. 
Um, also, one of the limitations, and I will close with this limitation, is that um, we work with one dynamic variables at a time. Uh, so we, for now, we just account for one dynamic variables. You can account for more dynamic variables, but then you will have a multivariate normal distribution again, and everything will become difficult. Again, the results that you will see here are not results that I want you to take for granted. Like, I really trust the results I showed you from the discrete continuous models. But um, I don't trust the numbers here, in the sense that this was just theoretical modeling development. We expect other people to use this and produce credible results. We wanted just to be able to calibrate this. So I think it's almost 1 o'clock. There are a number of, couple of minutes. Uh, I will stop here, because um, then um, this gives you an idea about what we are doing. Maybe I can show you some more results next week. Question about this. So there is not much out there. So there is not much way to compare this with other, what other people are doing. Can you see the idea behind this? So if everything is clear, um, enjoy your weekend.